it's nice uh, that Peter conceived this uh, symposium and gave us the opportunity to uh, come along. And as you uh, have heard, Greg and I have been on a paper together, uh, a couple of papers actually, but uh, that was done without actually getting to meet each other. So here we are. I'd also mention that there are many well-dressed people around here. I actually had a decent jacket when I left ASU three weeks ago to participate in a series of conferences in Europe, but it got left on one of the planes along the way. So if you see me casually around in a blue sweater, it doesn't look appropriate. That's the best I've got to keep warm. <laughs> so, uh, okay, there's a lot of water in this picture, and of course we're all very concerned with water. This is where I come from, Arizona State. Out in the desert there, people might think that there's not much chance of good science being done out there, but in point of fact, it seems very much to our surprise, I think, the opposite, uh, a couple of years ago, it was International Year of Chemistry, and they made a world ranking of chemistry departments by the number of sites per paper, and ASU actually came out pretty good. They're at number six in the world, ahead of MIT and ahead of the University of California and a lot of others, so, and Stanford, uh, for any Stanford fans, and that's because we have a lot of people there that are doing very high-profile work. It's not just the work of one person, and I'm very proud to, to be able to show this. I don't know how long it'll last. That was for a decade, and, and so we're to be taken seriously. Okay. So in the study of uh, glass-forming liquids, the system, the, the whole subject breaks down into two uh, important um, subsections, uh, one dealing with the uh, nucleation and growth of crystals, which have to be avoided if you're going to get glasses, and the other dealing with what the liquid behaves like and how the liquid behaves when the crystals don't form. And I've just come back from a meeting of 800 people in which this was the entire subject. But of course, at this meeting, uh, this is almost the entire subject. And so I've had to switch gears, and I hope I managed to do it uh, successfully. I've illustrated it with a couple of uh, typical figures, and you'll be seeing more of this TTT curve as we uh, go along. So the outline I want to follow is, uh, contains three sections, one giving the background to this business of nucleation and growth and a couple of my scientific heroes along the way. Uh, the measurement, determination of the time temperature transformation curves by isothermal calorimetry, but also the definition of the so-called homogeneous nucleation temperatures by continuous cooling calorimetry. And uh, uh, that's all very well, but that requires us then to recognize that what we're determining here is not uh, just nucleation, but some combination of nucleation and growth. And so there's an asymmetry in the, which we've heard a lot about. It's much easier to make a glass than to get back to the liquid without crystallization. And that comes from the fact that nucleation and, and nucleation plus growth are separable in time. And you might think that you completely suppressed the crystallization by uh, using a cooling rate sufficient to bypass the nose of the TTT curve to determine in the way I'll tell you. But in point of fact, you plunged right into the nucleation zone and your apparent glass is loaded up with nuclei, which then are ready to crystallize as you heat back up again. I want to show you how that happens and quantify it by experiments, and then recognizing that that's a problem for cryo-bio, in particular some cases we see where the recrystallization is explosive. Uh, I want to deal with that and uh, the problems it might create and possible solutions to them, many of which you've already uh, heard. Okay, that's my plan. Here is David Turnbull, uh, who formulated the uh, theory of um, classical nucleation and growth, and uh, uh, he was at Harvard for a long time and was one of my guiding spirits in the early work uh, I've done, and I like to show his photograph when I talk to people. A list of his key publications on the area we didn't spend any time on, and his description of the escape from the liquid configuration into the crystalline state requires nucleation, which usually happens in simple liquids, but doesn't if certain conditions are met, which we don't have to understand in great detail, but these are Turnbull papers and his uh, time tem temperature transformation or nucleation rate here as a function of reduced melting point, reduced temperature reduced by the melting point, which set the stage for all sorts of other work in the area, including that by Don Ullman, who was one of his students, who turned Turnbull's diagram on its side and gave it a name, the time temperature transformation curve, and defined the critical cooling rate, which you see here. So this is the uh, locus of... Uh, 
uh, uh, the times that it takes to crystallize at different times after you've plunged it from a stable state down into the supercooled state. And you see it has there's a temperature here where the crystallization rate is a maximum. And if you're going to cool and get a glass of wedding crystals, uh, you have to follow a regimen which doesn't cross that curve. And that's called the critical cooling rate. Uh, and it was deduced for the study of nucleation by itself, but that's not what we're measuring most of the time in the experiments that you see quoted for uh, aqueous solutions and cryoprotectant solutions. So that's what one of the things I need to clarify. Um, so just briefly, which sort of systems do form glasses? Uh, one of Ullman's obs uh, observations was that the ones that you know, form glasses easily, or have a high glass forming ability, are those that are already viscous at their melting points. Uh, how viscous? We can tell. Uh, the next diagram you won't follow too quickly because it's got a lot of stuff on it. I just want to say there's a way, there's a popular idea, the two-thirds rule, that if you uh, are going to get a glass that will have a glass transition temperature at two-thirds of the melting point, this diagram allows us to tell what viscosities we'll have or which ones are the easy ones to vitrify. And it turns out that the viscosity at the melting point, which is two-thirds here on this scale, uh, has to be about 10 to 100 centipoise. Not very high compared with the 10 to the 13th poise uh, typical of the glass transition. So uh, <laughs> what we, if we can do something to raise the viscosity of the water by either pressurizing it or adding stuff to it, uh, just enough to get the viscosity up to 10 to 15 uh, 10 to 100 times its normal viscosity, then we'll be able to stop the crystallization from occurring during moderately fast cooling. And that's, of course, what cryotectants, cryoprotectants are supposed to do. Uh, at which point I'm breaking from my voice for a second, water in one of its many, many spectacular antics. And if I want to drink you, I suggest you drink Right now, uh, it's on to the next stage here. Now I want to talk about nucleation and the TTT curve uh, and give some concepts of time scales which are involved in this because there's a time scale for escaping from the liquid state into the crystal state and there's a time scale for equilibrating within the, the liquid state, which is what Valeria was telling us about in her last talk. And I just want to see how these uh, time scales interact for glass forming and non-glass forming liquids. And then I'll give you some experimental data to uh, see how this all comes out in the lab. Uh, so I want to look at that uh, last curve, uh, the TTT T curve, but I'm going to turn it on back on into uh, Turnbull's type orientation with uh, time going up in the vertical axis and temperature going along here because frequently in the study of liquids you're looking at the relaxation time or the viscosity or something as a function of temperature on a horizontal axis or sometimes in inverse temperature. And uh, so this is the common orientation. So what I plotted here then are two time scales. Uh, one which is the one related to uh, viscosity and diffusion, uh, which is the time scale within the liquid, which is going to very long values as you approach the glassy state. And the other one is this what I call tau out, which is related to the viscosity by the Maxwell relationship which starts off at infinity at the melting point because there's no driving force to get the crystal at that point. And it gets shorter and shorter as the system gets more and more metastable and the driving force for crystallization in free energy gap uh, gets larger. And if it was just like this, then at this point here, uh, as Valeria has more or less indicated for the MW model of water, uh, there's a time scale crossing, and under that condition, at any lower temperature, the system has to crystallize, because any fluctuation will take you into the crystalline state. There's no way out of it. And if you're going to get a glass, something has to be changed about this diagram. So uh, here's what, uh, and this is, <laughs> sometimes you get attached to a diagram. This is coming from the days when you used to draw these things on transparencies. And of course, I could have a lovely electronic one now, but I like this diagram, so it's still here. And uh, it shows what happens uh, what you do, in effect, to these time temperature transformations or to the nucleation uh, rate curve uh, in order to get a glass. Uh, what you do is to reduce the melting point. Change the liquid, if you like, or in the case of our systems, we add something, a second component, and that, uh, without changing the 
uh, internal relaxation time. If you do that, then you change the, t the uh, temperature at which you start to get a finite um, escape time. And as you make the melting point lower and lower, close to in the glass transition, the TTT curve gets squashed out and the minimum time for crystallization gets pushed to longer and longer values. And the aim of the glass former is to push it beyond this 10 to the second power characteristic of the glass transition. Then you've got a really good glass former. Down here you've got a halfway decent glass former and then here the one I showed before you've got an absolutely impossible glass former. And water's pretty close to that. Water's pretty close to that. Uh, in our interest today, we're interested rather than in changing the liquid, we want to keep water there, so we want to change the composition of the aqueous solution. So we add different amounts of solutes, and in this way we depress the free energy to lower and lower values relative to the crystal, and the idea then is that you, by the intersection with the crystal free energy curve, tells you where the liquidus temperature is. And uh, here it is happening now as we add increasing amounts of solute. Again, we're doing the same thing, pushing the nose of the TTT uh, curve out to longer and longer values, and we end up getting a glass former, which is what we want because uh, then we preserve the oocyte or whatever we've put into it as an extra component. And then, uh, of course, in concept, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we can have an ideal glass former where we've managed to push the melting point below the glass temperature, which means we could never measure it. And there is a case in question, and here's the concept diagram where you've, you start with two different uh, liquids and mix them together, and there's a region there where the eutectic is below the glass temperature that would define the ideal glass system, and we'd never have to worry about crystallization and how nice that would be, and does it ever happen? Well, here's one case that I dug up long, long ago from the French literature of the case of dichromic acid where the melting point of ice is depressed down there, and the melting point of the next crystal is the same. And in this middle part here, all you see is a glass transition. So it goes into the glassy state in the thermodynamically stable condition. And that would then be impossible to crystallize. We actually use this system from experiments later on. I just want you to be aware of that possibility, uh, which gives another break from my voice and maybe... I <clears throat> bringing us to the uh, subject of experiments on this. So here's a differential scanning calorimeter, and uh, we're going to take a look at um, the determination of the uh, temperature, the time at which a crystallization event begins by putting a sample in and following this protocol, which I call the one-step isothermal calorimetry pr protocol. We drop the temperature through the melting point and then simply, uh, to a pre-assigned temperature and simply wait. And after a little while, uh, nuclei appear and then the crystals grow and they release the heat of fusion, which the calorimeter picks up as a peak. And then we take that point, which it corresponds to about 50% of the crystallizable water having frozen out, and we plot it. And we get this series of peaks here, and this is our, I think maybe this was the first uh, use of the differential scanning calorimeter to determine the TTT curve. Uh, here's another one where we combined it with some work by, earlier work by Doug McFarlane using electrical conductivity. Actually, this is on the next slide in more detail. Um, where he extended this out to 10 to the fifth seconds, very, very long times because conductivity is a wonderfully precise method. And we did a little calculation at the time from the estimates of the diffusion coefficient as how far the molecules, uh, the ice, the water molecules, had to diffuse uh, in order to um, crystallize at this temperature, which is very close to the water glass transition temperature. And it turned out to be a number we've heard quite a few times at this meeting, two nanometers. So here it is, uh, just we're picking up almost the homogeneous nucleation event in this experiment. <coughs> and uh, now that was done by emulsifying the solutions, lithium chloride water solutions, in order to protect against heterogeneous nucleation so that we could sequester most of the, of the dirt in the system which would provoke nucleation at uh, higher temperatures into a very tiny fraction of the sample and then we would see the homogeneous nucleation event 
uh, uncontaminated by other things. But it turns out that in the case of lithium chloride water, for a reason I don't fully understand, there's a zone in here, very close to the edge of the glass forming region, where you get exactly the same result from bulk samples. Sorry, it's a bit blurred. But bulk samples are the open circles, uh, the closed circles, and the uh, emulsified circles uh, uh, symbols are the uh, open symbols. And you see they're right on top of each other. So in that particular case, you don't have to worry about the home heterogeneous nucleation, uh, and I would like to understand why that is. <coughs> then uh, that's all very well. So we got these TTT curves for a lot of different systems, and, uh, uh, and now we want to talk about homogeneous nucleation uh, for, measured by continuous cooling, which requires it in just a different sort of apparatus. A couple of this, they were done with differential scanning calorimetry. This is done with a much more primitive system, DTA, but uh, quite nice because you can use very corrosive samples without worrying about having to replace your DSC head. And you get a nice signal when the ice crystallizes. And uh, you saw one of these plots in Valeria's talk. Uh, and here's a repetition of that with some relation to the nucleation rate for the different temperatures, which I don't need to go into. So this is a, a nice measurement to make, very simple. And uh, here it is for different uh, monovalent and divalent cations, and you can do it for any system you want. Uh, we plotted here on a reduced scale to take care of the different charges of the cations so that it looks like the glass-forming range <coughs> is determined by the ability of the cations to dismantle the water structure because it comes in uh, here at more or less the same uh, concentration on this equivalent concentration uh, regime. And this flattening region here, as you approach there, that's fairly significant. That we think is related to the precipitation uh, in the way that Valeria described of the um, pure water as a second phase, droplet phase, being pushed out of solution as we get into this zone uh, near the uh, approaching the water structure, and I'll show you more details in that later on. Uh, also for pressure, emulsion cooling, very good for pressure effects. And this is a paper we put into science quite a long time ago um, with pressure on this axis. Sometimes you see pressure here, sometimes you see pressure in this way. So this one was a pressure increasing over here. And now we see the, the melting point going down, as everyone knows, to about minus 20. But the nucleation temperature, homogeneous nucleation temperature, going right down to minus 90. <coughs> and water down here is about as, uh, is about as viscous as uh, honey. You know, it's, it's a very different sort of a liquid. <coughs> you can see a minimum in the T1 uh, the spin lattice relaxation time if you're into NMR. NMR. So, I've reoriented now to get pressure on the vertical axis, everything else the same, because this is where we uh, got involved with, uh, with Greg uh, after some preliminary measurements by Hitoshi Kano on the <coughs> depression of the homogeneous nucleation temperature by pressure. And we were doing this for purely academic reasons, but then Greg uh, in, with Doug McFarlane, who uh, joined us a little later, uh, so we saw the importance of pressure in the uh, cryobiological world, and so with his collaboration and advice, we looked at non-ionic uh, solutes, like DMSOPG in this particular case, and found the pressures at which we could completely suppress uh, the nucleation of water uh, for these different combinations of uh, solutes. Okay. So now I come to the second part, which is important to deal with, this asymmetry in the uh, vitrification and subsequent uh, warming, because so far all the uh, um, <coughs> figures I've shown you are determined by waiting for uh, roughly 50% of the available uh, water to crystallize. Uh, that requires a lot of growth of the nuclei, so it's not just nucleation. and uh, uh, and, and that recognition is important to understand this observation here, where we see that the systems which are uh, vitrified uh, during cooling when the TH is quite close to TG, or always, simply always crystallize during reheating. And it's a, and it's a bugbear in general that you uh, don't have this symmetry. Uh, you have to, if you want to avoid crystallization at any point, you have to reheat much faster than you cooled. And I want to explain how that just falls out of the next part of the experiments, 
uh, where we recognize that what we were determining here was this combination of nucleation and growth, and yet the nucleation process itself, involving very tiny particles and very small length scales, is intrinsically faster uh, and occurs at, with its maximum probability at a much lower temperature. Now, people in the glass business have talked about this for quite some time, but quantifying it has been more difficult. And just a simple adaptation of the uh, isothermal calorimetry method allows us to make this separation. And I still remember the, the moment of enlightenment when Kumar Kadiala, who was a young Indian high school uh, undergraduate student who was just working part-time with us on this project, and I looked into each other's eyes about after worrying about this distinction between the two and suddenly realized you know, at the same time uh, what we had to do about it. It was one of these very nice aha moments in science, and uh, I like to remember it. So uh, preliminary to that, we'd already wanted to separate uh, out the nucleation from the nucleation plus growth, uh, and we were doing it by theory. And Doug McFarlane with Avrami theory had uh, deduced that the nucleation curve should be here, and the TTT curve, which we determined by the isothermal calorimetry, was uh, this one. And you see that there's a difference in temperature between the two, and there's a difference in time scale. So if you uh, follow a critical cooling rate which bypasses the nose, and you say, aha, we've done it, actually what you've done is to plunge your system into the nucleation zone. So your v glasses that you formed are choking with nuclei if you like, and all you have to do is to heat it up again, those nuclei will grow, and whatever you were trying to protect is no longer protected. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see, that, 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 that was telling us that we needed to get the heating rate up, and we speculated about, in this paper with Greg, about the first of our papers, uh, about using microwave methods, but of course microwave methods uh, are not going to work for the sort of um, temperature range which we're interested in here because we're close to the glass temperature. Microwave is great for water with a relaxation time of, of picoseconds, but it's no good at all for ice. You can put a block of ice, this surprises many people, you can put a block of ice into the microwave and uh, turn on the microwave and nothing happens. Not until there's a layer of water around the outside and then it'll start to melt, but the microwave frequency is totally unsatisfactory for heating ice. So as we heard from uh, uh, from Brian work yesterday, you need to adjust your frequency of radiation if you want to excite the molecules and dissipate the electrical field energy at uh, temperatures which are not in the peak, uh, where the relaxation time is not in the, in the uh, microwave range. So this particular speculation about microwave methods is uh, not exactly the best one, but it was at least recognizing the idea that you had to do something. Now, the next one should yeah, this is a recognition of, of this. This is, a, this is a bit of a digression, but I want to draw attention to something quite cute that Jenny Green, who was in the audience uh, here, uh, helped us with. When we were trying to determine the characteristics of the uh, viscosity of liquids, which have, uh, and I think um, Brian mentioned this, have a, a tremendous range of, of values as the temperature goes from melting points down to the glass transition temperatures. They execute 15 orders of magnitude. So the frequency which would give maximum heating uh, near the melting point is 15 orders of magnitude wrong for giving maximum heating near the glass transition temperature. Well, we turn this into advantage to determine the fragility, which is the, you don't hear much about in cryo meetings, but it's got relevance. I mean, the, the polymer people took a long time to discover it too, but it, it refers to the rate at which the viscosity or the relaxation time changes with temperature as you rise above the glass transition uh, towards the melting point. And it's tremendously different for uh, different liquids, and it's an important liquid characteristic. So we thought of this um, heating by fields as a good way to find out what the fragility was, because we could fix an electric field uh, across the sample that we were doing DTA on, and if we fixed it at the halfway point, then we would find, we'd be able to det determine the F half of fr fragility, as we call it, just by seeing when there was a maximum heating rate. So here are some of the experiments. Here's the glass transition in DTA, and then here, this extra thing here, is where the liquid relaxation time crosses the exciting frequency, which was 10 to the sixth hertz. And, it's, and the heating effect goes as a square, uh, Greg um, and Brian told us this, I think, goes as a square of the electric field. So here's the, uh, the heating 
uh, effect at 87 volts, and here it is much larger at 177 volts, and it works very, very nicely. So it's a direct demonstration of what you need to do in principle if you want to maximally heat your system as you come up from the glass transition. You have to start with a microwave, which is not a microwave any longer, but it's something very, very much longer, uh, and has a frequency of around uh, uh, 10 to the... Um, no, let me get, get this straight. It's around one hertz, so about a millihertz, actually, at the glass transition. And then you, you would have to sort of tune your frequency as you heat up so that you're dissipating the energy at a maximum rate, always uh, satisfactory, or always in tune with the relaxation time. You'd have to have a very clever apparatus to do this. Uh, but then you could really maximize the heating rate all the way through from the bottom uh, up to the top where it's now thermodynamically stable again. That's a little bit complicated, and I'm sorry if I've... Um, expressed it badly, but at least it brings out the idea and the complications that you uh, have facing you as you try to figure out good uh, ways of avoiding the crystallization on the way back. <clears throat> Just a quick mention again then that Greg saw the importance of all these things and uh, wrote it up in a paper which was very nice and was kind enough to include Doug, who's now a famous guy out in Australia and leader of the field of ionic liquids and myself, uh, in his paper, which got mentioned in Stan Lebo's opening talk. And uh, long may it continue to acquire citations. <laughs> <coughs> so now, now we get a little bit more sophisticated with the, uh, the, the protocol. Instead of doing just one step and waiting, we say, OK, if there's a nucleation uh, TTT curve which is lying below the other one, how can we find out where it is and where its maximum is? So we invent this two-step method where we do a first short pulse a drop in temperature to well below the isothermal temperature we had here uh, and see if it makes any difference. And sure enough, the peak now moves to a much shorter time. So we've done something uh, to um, titillate the system and produce the nuclei, of course. And so we, by choosing the uh, temperature to which we drop this here, we can explore the nucleation rate. And uh, this was the first paper, I think, it was a 1984 paper describing this. And uh, here were the results. This was the TTT uh, curve from the one-step method. This was the deduced uh, nucleation rate from the McFarlane paper. And here was the experimental one. And this is the difference in time scales, which is um, not quite an order of magnitude. Uh, but it tells us that we would have to cool at least five times faster to bypass the nose of the nucleation TTT. Uh, than we did to bypass the nose of the nucleation plus growth TTT curve. So as I say, normal protocols would give you a glass which is loaded up with nuclei. Uh, here's another case of a very simple system without any water in it, but just to illustrate that you can do this in more than one system. And here, this is a full order of magnitude. The nose of this appears at a lower temperature and a full order of magnitude uh, shorter in time. So this is a fairly general phenomenon. You can do these measurements easily for many, many different systems and see what you've got. Uh, you know, this was a summary of this. Uh, it's easy to forget that a sample that is fully glassy because it's been cooled faster than the critical cooling rate might in fact be choked with nuclei. That's a take-home message. And we have to then, uh, of course, recognize that then when we reheat this, all these nuclei have to do and grow is grow. They don't have to jump over any energy barrier. Uh, uh, of the type that the Gloria, was, uh, that, sorry, the Valley was showing us, uh, but uh, they just have to grow. <laughs> and there is here a distinction, not so much between what Valeria showed us, but between most of the previous simulations, which, uh, when they're exploring the behavior of a crystallizable sample in a computer box, the box only has a thousand particles or something, very, very many smaller than her. And so most of the previous work has examined just the formation of a nucleus, not the nucleation and growth. So I don't know of any exper computer experiment, although I think Valets could do it, uh, in which this distinction between the nucleation and the nucleation and growth, and you implied it actually in a way, quite, quite directly, but you didn't show that what the sort of combination of um, TTT curves which I've just been dealing with. So that brings us to this case of aqueous systems particularly, which have some additional features, which uh, it's 
uh, fortunate for me have already been to an extent brought out in Valeria's talk because of this business of the special properties of water, the fact that it has these diverging fluctuations which are interpreted in terms of the possibilities of two sorts of water. And I heard a talk in Verena just uh, two weeks ago in which uh, people were producing macroscopic samples of these two polymorphs, polyamorphs, I should say, of water, chunks of it, that they could take out of their high-pressure apparatus and watch warm up. And one of them would, would, uh, would, would pop and break into crystals at one temperature, and the other half would do quite different things, because it was a quite different substance. It was, one of them was the low-density amorphous form, and the other was a high-density amorphous form. So water's almost unique like this. It has some co cousins. Uh, silicon is somewhat similar, and uh, silicon dioxide we find also on there. Anyway. <coughs> so uh, here's a paper which was based from quite a long time ago, dealing with lithium chloride water at the um, edge of its glass-forming range, which is about 11 moles of water per mole of lithium. And uh, you uh, heat it up in this DSC, in the, uh, the DTA was all we had at this time, and you see the glass temperature, and then a short time later, you see a huge uh, um, inflection of your uh, sample pen as the, a lot of heat is released. And you look at your sample, but it doesn't look any different at all. And, uh, except you don't want to look too closely because it's gonna blow up in your face. <laughs> it's, it's gonna burst the glass tube. And if you're lucky enough that it doesn't burst the glass tube, a little while later, you see it go blue opalescent, and then it turns white. Now what's happened? It's generated for some reason. Unlike most other glass-forming substances I'm familiar with, it's generated this tremendous host of nuclei, all of them far below the wavelength of light. And those nuclei have then uh, uh, have grown a little bit, but not much, because, and the liquid is very viscous at this point near the glass temperature, so it can't flow. And so there's a giant increase in pressure, and that's what blows the glass apart. Uh, and then after a little while, these nuclei grow to the wavelength of light uh, and give you the opalescence, and then you can see them. And if you rescan this now after this has happened, but before it's gone white, then you see the same thing, slightly different temperature, and only half of the magnitude, because all of the water's now gone, you've just got the lithium chloride water solution left, and... Uh, and a tiny rump of what you saw before. <clears throat> um, what did I want to say? Oh yes, unpublished work on, along the same theme. If instead of using the lithium chloride, we use aluminum, which of course has a giant electric field, three charges for a very small cation, orients about 35 water molecules around it, tears them away from the water structure. And so you can make a glass with a huge amount of water in it. And then if you pressurize it, you can make it with 50 moles of water per aluminum. And so now you've got all this water in there. Uh, if you make it under a high pressure and you reheat it, the pen goes, the differential thermocouple pen just goes wild. The release of enthalpy is huge and the glass goes all over the place. And that's because you've had a lot of vitreous water separate out in the... Uh, this is our first attempt to explain this phenomenon, which wasn't quite right. Um, the, the idea being that, like the case of silica, where it was known that you could get droplets of silica in your window glass, if you look in the electron microscope, uh, we said the same sort of thing here, but we thought it was a composition-driven thing, with a maximum uh, in the uh, phase separation domain away from water. Now we realize it's not like that at all. It's because of the polyamorphism of water, and uh, we've corrected it, and, 97 for the case of silica, and now um, Mishima, nicely supported by the work that Valeria showed you this morning, has uh, defined this for us for lithium chloride solutions which were vitrified uh, at modest pressures and then examined during warm-up. I, I won't try and walk you through this at all except to tell you that it, it, it gives uh, the... Uh, DTA evidence of the separation of the LDA phase here during the warm-up, uh, and this is the LDA phase which then becomes uh, the mother of ice, as Valeria told you, and this is what is the conversion which we are seeing uh, in that explosive crystallization. So, okay, 
that's potentially a problem. You can't get away from this uh, unless you add much more cryoprotectant, but then you've poisoned your cells. So uh, that's, that's why it's been so complicated, generating protocols which can somehow avoid the destruction of the tissues uh, because of this inevitable inevitability of small amounts of ice growing. Now, I don't have any uh, answers uh, to that except uh, more development of the sort of sophisticated heating schedules that, uh, that um, Brian was describing for us. Maybe there are solutes of classes different uh, which are more benign, uh, which I'd like to discuss privately with some of people because I really don't know much about what I'm uh, thinking, but except that there's some promising developments coming out of protein folding studies we've been involved in, which um, might suggest some additional types of solutions where the uh, generation of these tiny droplets of uh, pre-crystalline ice uh, could be avoided. Uh, I don't know, but it's a nice challenge. I think we're all working in a field where there's lots of excitement, where there's lots of benefit to mankind we can solve the problems, and it's exciting to be here amongst all of you who are deeply involved in this problem where you can do potentially such a lot of good, starting with rabbit kidneys and going a lot further in the future, and, uh, and it's been nice to get to know you. Thanks for hearing me. <laughs> You can, if you're willing to apply the Clapeyron Clausius relation, the Clapeyron equation, actually it is, uh, to the um, coexistence between uh, the two polymorphs of water, because uh, that has a volume dependence. The, 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 there's a difference in volume, and well, I gave you an estimate of it, between the two competing forms of water which are involved in this um, 
are critical like phenomena. So as you raise the pressure, you, you can see the evidence for this uh, by the uh, decrease in the rate at which the compressibility and the heat capacity, for that matter, rise anomalously. And by the time you get to the edge of the glass forming range, either by uh, change of composition, which is the one I'm more familiar with, or by increase of pressure, all those anomalies have gone. So it's no longer clear whether the, you're going to have an LDA-like fluctuation which will allow the ice to nucleate. And I think that's essentially what's happening with cryoprotectants. They're destroying the LDA-like phase and uh, structures and, and generating a solute water phase which has got a different uh, topological relationship between the molecules. And as Valeria's already said, again, uh, the nucleation barrier depends to a large extent on how topologically similar the liquid and the uh, crystal which is going to form are. So if you can distort the liquid structure away from that ice structure, then you're enhancing the probability of vitrification. And that's what all good cryobiologists are getting good at. Yeah? Let me say a word on the viscosity business because uh, one of the most striking things of water itself is the behavior of the transport properties. Valley mentioned power laws, but, uh, the, which, which apply to the thermodynamics, but they're uh, strikingly applicable, applicable also to the uh, transport properties, diffusivity and, and viscosity. And, uh, spin lattice relaxation time, which is one of the best ones to study it with because you can do it on these emulsion droplets. But again, as you raise the pressure towards two kilobars, or you raise the composition towards the edge of the glass forming range, uh, all those power laws disappear. And uh, they're, they're well explored by these viscosity measurements because the viscosity or other transport properties are an exponential reflection of what the thermodynamics is doing. So you can measure them very, very sensitively, which is why way, way back, Doug McFarlane and myself chose the electrical conductivity as a mechanism for studying the crystallization of water. And we could go right down to the glass transition temperature of, uh, the, at the edge of the glass forming range using that method. So yeah, transport measurements are good, and they tell you when the anomalies have gone. In, in this uh, slide right here, if you're using uh, the absorption of the uh, electromagnetic energy to quantify the fragility of the solution or track the fragility yeah. of the solution, it, it brings up a more general question. Why, why do you call solutions with that kind of slope fragile and the solutions with the near slope strong? And there must be some implication about the way the system is bonded together. And it seems important to us because in proper technical solutions, in proper biology, they all tend to be fragile uh, glass forms. I don't know what the physical implication of that is versus a strong glass form. Michael, let me, there, there are a couple of layers to your question. Let me try and uh, take them off one by one. Um, the word fragility was, uh, in some sense, uh, an unfortunate choice because people think of glasses as fragile when they're in the glassy state. But it was, uh, uh, it was borrowed from something that David Chandler once said about water. And I thought it was an attractive idea at this time that water had these properties because its structure was very, very sensitive to perturbations by thermodynamic uh, stresses or, or whatever. And uh, what it means, it, it seemed that we were seeing a reflection of this in the uh, glass forming systems. The ones which have this very sharp temperature dependence there uh, are those in which the structure is falling to pieces very rapidly as the temperature rises up. So we see that structure all by pressure, if you went the other way. And so we see that that particular structure is very fragile against stresses. Whereas at the other extreme, which is silicon dioxide, the, the granddaddy of all glass formers, it's a purely Arrhenius function of temperature and looks very boring until you go to temperatures much higher than the normal ones and to pressures much higher than the normal ones when you find that it also is becoming like water with a, with a second critical point and much less boring than we originally thought. 
But uh, okay, so that's some um, uh, structural characterization. And then going back to the, uh, the cryoprotectant character, uh, I'm not sure that I'd agree with you immediately because propylene glycol, which is one of the, and glycerol, which are two of the favorites, are actually in the middle of this uh, diagram. I, I would have to go right back to the beginning to get a diagram which has got all of the different glass formers on it. But when you put them all there, then glycerol and uh, propanol and, uh, and uh, propylene glycol are sort of sitting in the middle, as indeed is lithium chloride water, by the way. Uh, so the ones which are at the fragile edge are things like propylene carbonate and uh, and uh, decahydroisoquinoline, and, and they're fascinating. I mean, they're, they're as anharmonic as all get out in their solid states. And uh, just exactly what it is that determines whether a liquid's going to be fragile or non-fragile is a very open question at the moment, with lots and lots of hats in the ring to explain it. That's probably true, although if, if I look at lithium chloride water near the glass transition temperature, doing some suitable measurement, I mean, not bother what it is, that determines the fragility as I go from the uh, very easily glass forming, uh, high, uh, highly uh, um, so, um, crystal-like, um, I should say hydrate-like, and adding more water, it becomes stronger. It becomes stronger because we're building up the, the, the water hydrogen bond. I don't know why it is, but it, they definitely become stronger. So I don't know. No, that's not good, because beryllium fluoride is the younger brother of silica, but it's totally ionic, and it behaves in the same way. It's, it's to do with the, um, with the uh, ability of the structure to resist degradation under temperature, which is involved. Okay, I've got to get off of here. <laughs>